We're talking actors and directors who put on the shows. We're talking playwrights and designers who you'll want to know. From the very first rehearsal to the final curtain call. We, we might, might be off, 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 off Broadway, but we're talking about it all. Because we're two local gals with global pal. It's everything, everything, everything here. With Benita and Ellen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Everything Theater Podcast, the podcast where we talk about everything theater. Hi there, I'm Benita Zahn. And I'm Ellen Cribbs. Good to see you. And I should just a quick cable went out. Uh, so we're doing this. I've got my phone hooked up so I don't have my fancy dancy everything theater background. <laughs> just so as you know. And, you know, this winter, I, I haven't had a winter like this, Ellen, in like a decade or so. I feel like I've caught... I don't even have a kid in preschool and I'm catching everything. Oh. It's tis the season, Vanita. I mean, we got through COVID and now it's still around. People are still getting COVID and the flu and RSV and everything. It's an actor's nightmare. <laughs> you know, we both got shows coming up, so I got to get the voice back. But without further ado, and we just saw a quick moment of him, James Barry joins us. He is a uh, producing artistic creative director, the man of the hour, the guy who's running the Chester Theater Company in Chester, Massachusetts. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for co-running co it all with, with my wife, Tara Franklin, I should say. <laughs> yes, yes. If you didn't get in right away, you couldn't go home. That's right. <laughs> leave the room you're in. Um, 35th anniversary for the theater. If I did do, it, I do my math right, you two are the third to run the th run the theater fourth i think so the the theater was founded um in the 90s by vincent dowling who right. um chose to live in chester and set up <laughs> camp there and start the theater he was once the artistic director of the abbey theater in dublin ireland um and he was in a bunch of the shows in the 90s um and then byam stevens was artistic director for 16 seasons i think and then um our uh daniel <laughs> Elihu Kramer uh, was the artistic director for seven seasons, and Tara and I, uh, our first summer at the helm was was last season, and we're gearing up for this one. And you folks do really interesting theater. Um, you're not going to see um, Neil Simon, and you, it's a lot of thought provoking shows, commitment to uh, anti racism really a commitment as i'm reading a commitment to um embracing the audience's power of thought yeah certainly and this is um you know i started my affiliation with chester as an actor uh the first season i worked there was in 2011 and th those are the very things you just described that i fell in love with about the place um so we Tara and I now as co-producing artistic directors, we really inherited not only uh, the legacy of this theater, and we're very proud to be the stewards of it, but the the theater over time has cultivated an audience that, you know, this is what they want and it's what they come to expect. Um, you know, a lot of things we do are just because of necessity. You know, we only do small cast shows because it's not just the size of our budget, but the realities of housing. And I don't know where we put everybody backstage. It's a very small operation in all ways. Um, and uh, so it's really, as you said, it's a lot of really, you know, actor driven storytelling. It's a great director's theater, but it's not a, a spectacle theater. Um, it's a very modest grid. There's no flies, you know, it's very, you know, in the small cast shows, it's a very intimate experience. And an equity house. Absolutely. Yep. You, you're talking For about sure. small, it was known as the miniature theater of Chester. It was. Uh, yeah. We're, we're glad to have dropped the miniature bit. I think a lot of people thought they were in for like, um, you know, and a lot of my friends are very, very serious puppeteers, but I think a lot of people were thinking like, oh gosh, it's going to be like marionettes or something. And like, that is awesome, but that's not what we do at Chester <laughs> Theater Company. I mean, maybe, maybe we'll find the right project. So I, I'll I know some wonderful never. puppeteers in the capital region and oh, they do sure. large scale puppets. It's a husband oh, and wife it's amazing. who do this. So talk to us a little bit about uh, where your artists come from, James. 
Uh, sure. I mean, they come from all over. Uh, every season, we uh, hire a cohort of seven <laughs> interns um, that go to college all over the country, um, and they help us in a, a number of capacities. Um, we have stage management interns. Um, we have arts admin interns. Uh, we have, uh, and then various technical positions, electrics, uh, costume and props, and uh, carpentry. Um, and then we cast, uh, you know, I, I don't know how different or similar our process is to, to other <laughs> theaters because I had never produced or cast until I, I took this job. So, you know, there's definitely some of that, like I think any theater where we, we think of a play <laughs> and we say, oh, you know, who'd be tremendous in this. And then we just ask that person. <laughs> but but we um but we do there's a sort of a roster of um of favorites we really love also uh you know celebrating the incredible talent pool that's native to our region i mean so many people have chosen so many incredible artists have chosen to make their homes in the capital region in western massachusetts and the berkshires and the pioneer valley um and they're they're here and they want to do cool stuff and we want to do cool stuff with them. But of course we cast that in New York. We're having our big uh, EPAs on February 16th uh, in the city. And we'll also have a, a local EPA in the Chester Town Hall. Talk a little bit about your upcoming season. Sure. Um, which I just, I, I finally, I, I found online. It's a oh, bit of yeah. a well-kept secret. <laughs> well, yes, I I think that uh, I think Equity accidentally sort of outed us with the uh, with the coming auditions about what we're doing. But big story should be running in the Berkshire Eagle soon. <laughs> For those of you not combing backstage <laughs> to find out what theater seasons are, but uh, yeah, like we're going to small life, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We're going to start with a, a Lucas Snath play called The Thin Place. Uh, and Chester, we have a bit of a tradition. I've seen um, over the years some truly excellent sort of horror and suspense plays. And that's that's tough to do because it has to be psychological, I think, in theater. Like you can't put, you know, a monster on stage and really be scary like you can in a film. So this is really about um, the power of the mind. It's almost sort of willing uh, a seance into the room with the audience present um it's it's kind of about the the thin veneer between the world that we're familiar with and maybe another one uh it's it's very compelling um and uh we're really excited to have Gabby Farah direct that piece uh Gabby was a student uh at Smith College where uh my wife uh Tara Franklin co-producing artistic director she teaches uh she's a theater lecturer there and it's actually where I got my MFA in playwriting during the darkest days of the lockdown. So we have a lot of Smith College pride in the house. And she graduated a while ago, but I saw um, this Carol Churchill play um, far away that she directed as a student production and it knocked my socks off. And then come to find out she spent a year as a fellow with Club Thumb and then a year as a fellow with Playwrights Horizons. And she's just, bursting with all these phenomenal ideas and we couldn't be prouder to 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 have her she's actually going to be assisting the playwright uh David Adjmi on the the Broadway transfer of Stereophonic so that's what she's going to be doing right before she comes to us to direct which is very exciting wow. and we're before we're also you get grateful. to the next yeah I was just, just I want to jump in because you that comp the, the relationship there the theater has had about more than a dozen, just under two dozen shows go from here to New York. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I was very lucky to have the, the show that I kicked off our, our 2023 season. Uh, we, we transferred that off Broadway to Ur Urban Stages in the fall. It was, it was such a thrill. Um, and it was, uh, I wish I could say that I was the architect of some grand designer plan to make that happen but it was really just uh, a lot of right place at the right time serendipity and good kind people wanting to keep a good thing going i i just feel so grateful 
We continue on so with your after, season. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, not at all. Yeah. Oh, you, you, I'm the. Oh gosh, I've been teaching theater history at Westfield State this year. I am the easiest person to sidetrack, <laughs> and I think it's it's fun for my students. So sidetrack me all you like. Um, I love it. Uh, next, um, I'm really proud. The shows two and three we're really doubling down on our commitment to not just new work, but brand new work. So we're doing two world premieres in the middle. Um, one is a, a piece that I'll be directing called Unreconciled, uh, which is written by Jay Sefton and Mark Basquill and starring Jay Sefton. It's an autobiographical piece about his youth in the Philadelphia metro area. He was cast as uh, Jesus in the, in the Passion Play, um, and the play was directed by an abusive uh, pedophile priest. Um, and this is very heavy duty and I, I, it's a, a difficult uh, themes and topics to discuss, but what I really am so grateful to have the opportunity to talk to you about and everyone out there listening to your show is that um, it's also incredibly funny and moving. It's a tour de force. It's Jay stepping into fully inhabiting dozens of people from his own life and it is a phenomenal achievement for him as a performer. <laughs> Perhaps you saw Jay in, um, Jay was Legionnaire in Cap Rep's production of What the Constitution Means to Me. Uh, so if you saw that, you saw Jay. He's an incredibly warm, generous performer and um, certainly generous with the stories of his life and uh, just what an incredible actor and an incredible story. Um, and we've been doing some workshops of it together. We did a, a brief workshop that actually our intern company uh, collaborated with me as uh, the creative team um, last summer. We did two nights only and the word of mouth and buzz was extraordinary. We, we couldn't believe it. Um, we did another very limited run at City Space in East Hampton, Massachusetts. And um, I think we're ready. I think we're we're really ready to put our full weight behind it. I think the script is is gorgeous. Um, and I'm so excited to, you know, put a little bit more money behind the design elements and, you know, really, really give Jay as a performer and Jay and Mark as writers, uh, you know, the best production we can make of it. Um, should and I go, got Will go on through the season? Or? Will yeah, Sacrifice, we'll... yes, another world premiere. Uh, Julie McKee uh, came through uh, Yale's MFA playwriting program. Um, uh, and it's, I, you know, I'm just, this is one of the plays, every play comes, <laughs> it's a different route, how it gets, crosses your desk or, or, or arrives. Um, you know, this one, I, I knew that, Tara and I knew we really wanted to bring Kira Naughton back to direct. She's a great friend of ours, a tremendous theater artist, a wonderful director who's done some truly beautiful work at Chester and a number of other places. She directed me and Will Eno's title and deed the year during lockdown where Daniel um, had us perform uh, under a wedding tent at Hancock Shaker Village, which was amazing. Um, so Kira and I collaborated there. Uh, she did this beautiful production of Curve of Departure at Chester, but this is a brand new piece, a uh, really quirky play <laughs> with a lot of heart. It almost has kind of like a, a dreamlike logic to it. I'm, I'm, and I'm so excited to see what the, the creative and design team come up with to sort of suggest things imagistically and, and, and min minimally. I'm, I'm, I can't wait to be in on these production <laughs> meetings. But, How many um, seats in your house? Oh gosh, I think a about 125. Yeah, and we each show, and it's everything about us is small. You know, each show, each of the four shows gets a 12 performance run over two long weekends, and that's that. And and it can be uh, as as much of a joy as it is to as an actor. I felt like I was finally doing the work when I started working at Chester that I had always wanted to do. You know, I, I got to do The Aliens by Annie Baker. I got to do Wittenberg by David Davalos. I got to do all these modern contemporary, you know, really exciting, you know, heart, full of heart and grit and, you know, these shows. And then uh, because the play probably only has two or three people in it, you have an enormous amount of heavy lifting to do uh, as an actor. And then you get 12 cracks at it 
and it's gone, you know? <laughs> so we always joke like closing, right? All right, we're ready to open. Let's do this thing, <laughs> you know? Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's also also part of the uh, part of part of the joy of Chester too. It's uh, it's a really intense crucible of of uh, artistic mojo, and then it's gone. Big yeah. big big sky, big big sky is such a beautiful play. Um, uh, we did a Tom Wells play called Folk uh, a number of seasons ago. Um, there's always kind of a fun musical element uh, often in his plays, but, uh, this is gorgeous. Uh, James Warwick is, is returning to us to direct this piece. Um, a really, uh, just a lovely sort of chestery. I, I don't know what that adjective means, but I, we apply it to all the plays we produce. It's, you know, it's just quirky actor, uh, you know, just people really get to stretch and, and fully inhabit these really wonderful, you know, multi-dimensional roles. And this is uh, this is really about watching sort of two couples realize they're falling in love, but it's also about uh, ecological crisis. So there's a lot of um, a lot of plates in the air uh, in this Tom Wells piece. Um, he's really good at that. Like um, Lucy Kirkwood is really good at that too, of, of having sort of an overarching theme that is never um there's never a compromise to the integrity of the characters and how they're written you know we're we're serving a, a, a larger overarching agenda without ever sacrificing you know how human these people are and their foibles and it's just really beautiful stuff um so yeah, i'm really glad that there's there's so much there's a lot of romance and love uh at the end of the season after we open with the scary play uh, and really have some extraordinarily challenging themes as much heart and humor and love is in Unreconciled. It's really an emotional ride. Um, they're all emotional, you know? I guess that's what we do. My wife made a great point. She said, you know, it's like we're, it's like we get to be a second stage without a main stage all the time. Uh, it's kind of what, what our theater is, you know? I thought she, that was so astute of the, the way she summed that up, but. Yeah, that's it. You know, we only have a hundred and twenty-five seats to fill, so come on down and fill them. <laughs> now that's so half your season are world premieres. Is that pretty typical for your season, or does it vary year to year? I I would say that's unusual to have two. I mean, we love having one, but even that doesn't happen every year. Uh, typically, the rule of thumb, we try and produce work that's you know at the maximum. 15 years old hmm. um so there's a real commitment to contemporary work um and it is cool because we um we we do we have seen a lot more new theater we um in lieu of having a big sort of fundraising gala uh this really beautiful system we inherited at chester when we began our tenure as artistic directors is we take two theater trips a year. So we curate these experiences. And when you buy the package, it includes a donation to our theater. So we're getting ready to take uh, nearly 40 travelers to London for a week of theater going. But this past fall, we went to the Dublin International Theater Festival where four of the five plays we saw were world premieres. Um, and so, um, yeah, I was frantically, there was one play I said, oh gosh, we have to produce this. And I got a hold of the playwright's agent. And I think that they have their, their hearts set on perhaps a, a, a bigger American splash than, <laughs> than having, having Chester Theater Company. But I'll, I'm going to keep asking because I, I'm very passionate about this play. Um, but yeah, so it's been, it's been great to, to see more theater lately too, as a result of those trips. And it's like just great community building too. So no matter where you live, people come on our tours from all over, even people who don't live within striking distance of Chester to see our shows in the summer. So if anybody out there, the, the London trip is closed, but um, if you look on our website, Chester Theater, that's R-E, uh, the sort of fancy way, dot org, um, You'll see that every fall is a different place we go to in October, but every March we go to London and we've been staying at the same hotel 
for years. It's amazing. It's almost worth it just to go for the breakfast at this place. Um, and the theater's great too. But um, <laughs> and and we uh, we we kind of model some of the things we do in the summer in Chester on these tours, where every morning after breakfast we get together at this pub across the street in this little um, meeting room they have upstairs. We have our coffees and we have a group chat about what we saw the night before. Mm. Uh, and Tara and I facilitate these uh, these post show discussions, um, and. I love them. I loved them as an actor when I began at Chester over a decade ago. And I love them in a, as an audience member and I love them now as a producer. Um, it's such a great community building exercise and people I, invariably after every single one and half of our performances in the summer are followed by some kind of post-show conversation or event. Um, people always uh cause me to view what we just saw in in a in a from an angle i had never entertained um so we just never stop learning about the work um and what it means to people uh it's, you know, it's james something we've talked about ellen and i with you know we've talked to folks all over you know running theaters and that this post uh pandemic time a lot of audiences want light yeah. They want funny. They want feel good. Yeah. And that's not what you folks do. So is the success because you have a uh, a cadre of supporters who know that they're going to come and see something very different in your house than they will anywhere else? I'm wondering the, the, the how that's working. Now. Yeah, I, I, that's that's very insightful. I, I I think that's certainly part of it. I mean, the theater has built a reputation over many years for you know doing the kind of work that we do. Uh, at the same time, I think that um, you know we we do produce things uh, every year. I think that that do make you feel good and and do. Um, celebrate our shared humanity and do uh, have, uh, you know, ultimately a very positive message. It's just not always in the ways you expect, and it's not going to be that every single time out. We've got, you know, a lot of, a lot of ideas to tackle and a lot of things that I think are important to talk about. It's about striking a balance. I mean, with, with, with the season, you know, but um. We do. We're we're very fortunate. We have a very adventurous uh, subscriber base and and sort of you know core group of of audience members, many of whom have been supporting the theater for for decades now. And um, we're so grateful to them. Um, you know, we couldn't do it if 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 people didn't you know enough people didn't want it. So. Um, you know, we are we are feeling very lucky, but I think this season should be a, a good blend of some of the more uh, some of the more challenging and daring material and some just some sweet romance. You know, we just need some need some sunshine. Now, circling back to your um, post show discussions, uh, Benita, yeah. actually, you had posted an article. I can't remember what it was from um, about kind of the the talk back and whether it was an effective means and as is it actually hurting theaters versus helping. Um, it sounds like you've had very successful talkbacks. Can you talk to us about what you think makes a successful conversation with your audience? Yeah, sure. I mean, and I, you know, I'm really, I love facilitating the post-show chats and that was a really nerve wracking. It was sort of a trial by fire on our first London trip where all of a sudden we realized, oh gosh, it's, it's us. We're doing this every morning. <laughs> um, and then, um, but it, it, you know, I, I, we loved it. And, and I was especially proud to, to, to do them in Chester uh, in our first season too. I think, I think it's a lot about you need to have strong ideas about you have to really own why you're producing the work you're producing and really be able to speak to your love for it and and why that is but ultimately the crowd really takes over you listen to people I like we like to start with um let's talk about you know the design elements or or what did you see like when you first walked into the space 
you know, do you feel like you were set up for something in particular? Did did just looking at this particular set or whatever the pre-show music was, did that inspire anything in you? So we start there and then we kind of get into the themes and we talk about, you know, how does the particular structure of this play serve its artistic purposes? How does, um, you know, did the costume design play a role in how you felt about people or, you know, some of that stuff. But, you know, so we always have these ideas we can come back to and get people talking, but our crowds have ideas and they really, uh, you know, again, like I, every single talk back, somebody out there, often multiple people totally blow my mind with some connection they drew to another piece of art or a, a, a personal story from their own life that um, they were, you know, caused them to reflect on because of the work we just produced. It's, it really, you kind of just, you keep it, you keep it rolling and you keep, you know, you keep everybody, you know, you know, you try and keep, stay on tap. Like a lot of, some plays will inspire like a very particular line of talking. You're like, okay, let's, <laughs> Let's let's move on. Let's get out of this rut. But I, you know, I the the crowd does a lot of the heavy lifting for us, um, which is a joy uh, to sort of you know just sort of gently steer as all these smart, passionate people tell me these profound things about how the play related to their life or something they read about, or it's it's marvelous. <laughs> We talked to um, our last guest a lot about like creating that community. And it sounds like you have a very strong subscriber base. Um, is there a, uh, do you, can you speak a little bit of to how you talk to your audience about what they would like to see in the future, if that impacts your programming for future years and how you have that conversation within the community? Yeah, I mean, again, I think we're very lucky to sort of have the reputation that we do as a theater where, you know, people expect us to produce the type of work that we produce. And, you know, not every play is going to be every single person's favorite every time out. But I think even when um, I get, we get a lot of feedback about how like, well, I liked these three, this one wasn't my favorite, but I thought it was a bold choice or it's still, we had a great chat about it on the drive home. Um, you know, and I think a, a big part of our gig is, is, presenting the unbelievable array of diverse modes of storytelling um all all the all the different styles of of, of theater making that are happening right now um we really want to show really keep our finger on the pulse of what makes contemporary american theater special so um part of that is 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 giving you know as big a, a swath of it as we can with our limited season but um you know a lot of some of the feedback that that we've been getting has actually been really interesting we're actually changing our schedule to create more matinees because our location is really remote and this has been a thing a lot of people are like you know i i don't want to drive here at night all the time and i, I get it <laughs> you know so we're uh we're gonna be uh we're doing an experiment that I'm really excited about that I think is going to be wonderful. We're going to have Friday matinees this year. Um, and, uh, and I, I think it'll be, uh, I think it'll be great. You know, so many people, you know, and uh, with the talkbacks too, I just wanted to circle back to this. The, um, we also hear a lot that people buy specific uh, tickets to shows because they know there's going to be a panel discussion or because they know this is the cast conversation. So it, the different types of talkbacks we do also have their own sort of microcosm, you know, fan groups, you know, that <laughs> want to know, want to hear from the panel of experts in a field <laughs> germane to a topic in the play, or they want to ask the actors questions on the cast conversation date or whatever it may be. So Again, yeah, we're just, I, our audiences spoil us rotten. We're very lucky. Now, is that additional is there... matinee in, in place of another show or an additional performance? Yeah, we're keeping it a 12 show schedule. We're just kind of moving some things around. Hmm. Is there something out there that you've had, besides the one you talked about that you saw in uh, Europe, 
something you've had your eyes on that you're still trying to bring in? Oh, geez. Well, there, uh, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's tough because in some ways it's very helpful how limited <laughs> the scope of what we can produce is because it has to be, it has to be very contemporary, but also we have 12 actor contracts for the season and that's it. So if you do a play with five people in it, you only have seven roles for the other three shows. So we're, we're always looking for very small cast shows and a lot of really exciting things that have been happening. Many of them are smaller casts, but a lot of them are, you know, are, are more, did they just, you know, even, even plays like, um, I don't know. It's yeah. There's a huge short list of things we'd love to do, but, but it's been great. And, and we got to produce uh, a couple of those last season. So like Guards at the Taj by Rajiv Joseph has been a favorite play of mine since I saw that in previews at the Geffen in Los Angeles like nine years ago. Um, and so when we realized we were planning our first season, I thought, oh my gosh, we have to, we have to do this. Um, and then uh, and then we had also uh, Daniel Kramer our our friend the previous artistic director back to direct um annie baker's circle mirror transformation which i think has been on the short list for a long time so we got to do those two projects which you know really made us all we were so proud to to produce those we were proud to produce it all but um those are two that were that were very premeditated um, we got to get on the road and get to come and see you. Yeah, yeah, come on out. Come on out. We'll get some dinner. It'll be fun. Right. And we've got to pair you up also with two fellas who run the Harbinger Theater here in the Capital oh. District. Oh, uh, Patrick I'd love White and to Chris meet them. Foster, yes. Because they're dedicated to doing premieres. Love it. Premieres, first times. Um, they're not a pro house. You are. But the level of quality that they put on is just fabulous so i'm seeing a real dynamic here yeah between That's we're gonna throw them in the car bring out do, do we have are they sponsoring tonight ellen uh not tonight yeah. uh we'll talk about them soon the next show coming up in the blood yeah yeah but don't you think got married all this oh yeah that sounds i would love i would love to meet them i'd love to get out to the theater and see some stuff too and it's you're not that far a drive no, no, I, I actually, I, I, I just directed my first show in Albany uh, this past holiday season. I was at, uh, I was working for for Maggie at the Rep. It was a blast. Oh, golly gee, Ellen, we could have sat down with him face to face. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's wonderful. It's a very dynamic artistic community. In fact, uh, Patrick and Chris are trying to, uh, create a festival and like what name can they call it to encompass it's more than just upstate new york because there is massachusetts you know we pull from a wide area so sure. uh, hearing about your uh, I'm i'm glad i read backstage <laughs> a legit story will break soon i promise <laughs> <laughs> that's how i found out about you guys you know really in our backyard and um, your well-kept secret um, at, once you hit the border. So not such a well-kept secret anymore, Pat, you know? <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, for, for spreading <laughs> the word. We really appreciate it. Oh, well, absolutely. Ellen, do we have any time left? You know what? We got three minutes. We can do a super fast close up. Uh, we usually end up our episode with just some <laughs> rapid fire questions about you specifically. So, oh boy. James, are you ready for a really quick close up? Yeah, let's do it. What was the moment when you knew you had to do theater? Playing Prometheus chained, fake chained to an invisible rock in an elementary school uh, Greek mythology thing. What As the you... bird pecked my liver out or whatever organ he loses <laughs> over and over and over again. And the teacher was like, you were really good in that. I was like, yeah. So there we go. What did your family think when you said, I'm going to go pursue theater? 
my my parents were very very supportive uh i was extremely lucky in that that is i know it's a joke that <laughs> there was a <laughs> that's yeah. but my parents they i mean they drove me to rehearsals i got really involved in a local community theater when i was in high school i was doing shows as a kid at at yukon um i just they they were they've always been they've always championed my um my ambitions in the performing arts so i'm very lucky and grateful What's a show that's had a huge impact on your life, whether that you've seen or been a part of? Wow. Um, working with uh, Alex Timbers and Michael Friedman on Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson for a, about a three year span. I was in both casts at The Public and then the Broadway transfer and working with those two guys so closely over that those three years, it was, um, it was really eye opening. It was really incredible. Um, everyone was the same age. I couldn't believe that these guys who were my peers age wise were making this thing happen. Um, yeah. Uh, it just in a really, uh, irreverent comedy that had a lot of heart. I love when style is difficult to put your finger on why it works for you. And that was sort of like, it was just a kind of like walking in a dream for three years. I totally had imposter syndrome the whole time I was involved, but it was, it was an amazing ride. Well, sadly, I think we're running out of time, but that is so great. I mean, you have such a huge resume. Um, everyone, you need to look up what all the things you've done and now to be a producer of this amazing company. It's, it's incredible. Thank you. I feel so lucky. I, I, yeah. I, I will. Please let me know if you're going to make it out to Chester. We'll, we'll get some, we'll get some dinner. I'll make sure you've got your seats of the 125 are fantastic. <laughs> We're going to make it happen. James Barry, along with his wife, Tara Franklin, uh, the co-producers and artistic directors of the Chester theater company. Delightful talking with you tonight. Really just wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening to the Everything Theater Podcast. Special thanks goes out to Alice Grinling for our photography and Justin Friello for composing our amazing theme song. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you want to share your thoughts or what's going on in your theater community, you can reach out to us on social media or through our email at everythingtheaterpodcast at gmail.com. Till next time. It's everything, everything, everything. everything.